Good afternoon, good evening, good morning from Field and Graduate University. Welcome to our Thoughts in the Time of Corona, Voices from Field and Graduate University webinar. My name is David Blake Willis, Professor of Anthropology in the School of Leadership Studies and Professor Emeritus from Soai Buddhist University, Osaka, Japan. I am coming to you from Sacramento, Northern California, USA. My co-host is Dr. Frederick Steyer, Professor and co-lead of Fielding's Media Technology and Innovation Concentration and a professor of communication and systems at the University of South Florida in Tampa, where he is joining us from today. Our panelists today are speaking to us from Laguna Beach, California, USA, Anchorage, Alaska, USA, Corona Del Mar in Redondo Beach, California, USA, Shanghai, China, and Shalmetla, Mexico. We have organized today's webinar on thoughts in the time of Corona, voices from Field and Graduate University, to share a range of perspectives on one of the most challenging events of our times, the coronavirus or COVID-19. The coronavirus is, in the words of Pope Francis to us a few days ago, testing our whole human family. He called for solidarity around the world in the face of the pandemic, and our thoughts and prayers are, first of all, with those directly affected by the coronavirus, the sick and those who have died, families who are challenged and in mourning, and those powerful workers on the front lines, nurses, doctors, healthcare staff, and all those providing us with essential services. Let us share a moment of silence for all of the people directly affected by the coronavirus. Thank you. We recognize too the uncertain economic future, unemployment, and massive challenges for many of us around the world. We at Fielding Graduate University, our staff, alumni, students, and faculty bring an array of experience and research to understand the coronavirus and its impacts on individuals, communities, and societies of bringing what we hope will be light in the face of darkness. This is indeed an epical challenge for the whole world. I'd like to begin with a few words from our president, Katrina Rogers. Uh, Katrina, would you like to share a few words here with us all? Yes, welcome everyone to our faculty uh, who have done a lot to organize, not just this event, but many other webinars over these past six weeks. To our students, welcome. To alumni who have been participating in record numbers since the stay at home order. Um, several weeks ago, and also to community members. I know that this seminar is open to members of the public. It is often the case that adversity reveals things about ourselves. And I think they also, adversity reveals things about organizations. And in our case, Fielding Graduate University, for those who may not know Fielding very well, we are an independent nonprofit graduate school focused on the social sciences mostly at the doctoral level, but also masters and certificates. It's been very curious and interesting to observe what strengths have been revealed um, by this situation, at least in terms of our own university. Uh, for example, we've been experts at adult learning for well over 45 years now. And many of, and it turned out that this was a natural strength for us in the distributed graduate environment in that we were really able to offer and have a very smooth transition for our faculty and students when the world changed uh, from uh, first in China for our Chinese students and alumni were affected first and then all over the world. Uh, in addition, I, I want to just call out and share how much our faculty have stepped up to engage even more with our students in making sure that our students are able to make progress, but also really bend their research and create sort of flexible learning opportunities as much as possible for you to do what you need to do well. Uh, third, it's been such a welcome experience to engage more with alumni and see our graduates coming back. And I, I see some of you on our chat already. 
And it's just such a pleasure to have you wherever you are in the world, you know that fielding is here for you. And then the, the outreach that we're doing to community. I think another thing to think about is how not just at fielding, but as you yourself are making meaning individually and then collectively with others about COVID-19, to think about some of the characteristics that we see are emerging. I mean, clearly we see many things welcome and unwelcome in, in, our, in our own societal behavior and the ways in which we treat each other. We're also seeing other things, I think, that, that underlie some of the, the strengths and resilience and adapt, adaptations that we see. Agility, flexibility, uh, the ability to be focused, the caring, the collaboration. I think these are the essence of the characteristics that make um, uh, it that's very helpful for perspective seeking and for building the kinds of collective sense making that we need to for something this, this important. And I think lastly, when we think of a pandemic, I often think about, you know, eventually that'll be behind us, right? These things will be in our rear view mirror, but there'll be, there'll be other things. And I think as we think about ourselves as leaders, as scholars, as practitioners in the 21st century, I think we should ask ourselves, what does it mean to be prepared for episodic events like this, episodic uh, situations that, call, that are very difficult and that are, are very impactful for not just human beings, but for all that inhabit the planet. So I will leave you with that and turn you over to this wonderful cadre of colleagues who have so much to share with us tonight. So thank you very much, David, appreciate it. Thank you, Katrina, for those heartfelt words. As my colleague Fred has said in a different context, that of overheating and the climate crisis in our world. To solve humanity's biggest crises, we have to learn how to learn together in new ways. Fred, before we start, perhaps you have a few thoughts to share with us as well. Yeah, thanks, David. Just very briefly, that um, thanks for that quote. It actually comes from an interview that was done with me as part of the overheating project. But one of the things that was the basis of that that will be paramount to what we're talking about today is you know, from a system's point of view, how everything is interconnected, right? At the same time, that's one of the things that we're actually living with. What are some of the consequences of things being interconnected when that which is connecting us is a virus, for example? So what I invite people to think about tonight as we're listening to our six panelists and to each other are questions of what are the patterns that connect us? How can we change something where this interconnection is actually causing problems to think about them in more positive ways. Uh, the basis of the overheating project actually was recognizing how when we're in the public domain, conversations around climate change, conversations around national identity and immigration, and conversations about economic issues all had the same patterns where there were difficulties in terms of self-corrections. We could add to that conversations around health and how we actually make sure that being healthy, having a healthy body, having a healthy planet is what's paramount for us. So thanks for setting this up, David, and thank you, Katrina. Thank you so much, Fred, for your thoughtful comments there. Uh, each of our participants is gonna share their thoughts for seven or eight minutes, and then we may have uh, time for a couple of questions. Our panelists will speak to three themes, what the coronavirus has meant to them on the ground in their experience, the perceptions of the coronavirus, the fears and realities that are out there, again, from, from their background, and then the lessons learned and what's needed from their perspective. For those of you who are joining our webinar, please use the chat function to let us know where you are and feel free to use it to connect with other attendees. Uh, no worries on your camera or microphone. The only people you will see or hear are the panelists. If you have questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A function. So we'll move to our first speaker, Dr. Randy Bell. Randy is the CEO of the Landmark Research Group in Laguna Beach, California. And Dr. Bell is a sociologist and economist who, has, who specializes in disaster recovery projects. Uh, Randy has consulted in more tragedies around the world than anyone. Uh, he has uh, literally been at uh, the major sites of disasters like the World Trade Center, Flight 93, consulted on these sites, Sandy Hook, BP oil, hurricanes, Katrina and Harvey, the Bikini Atoll nuclear test sites, 
uh, the Northridge earthquake, and uh, have a look at Rolling Stone magazine and Randy's name to learn about uh, O.J. Simpson, John Benet Ramsey, Heaven's Gate, and hundreds of other cases. So, Randy, uh, you have uh, also uh, profiled yourself uh, on TV, many other places. Randy's also been active in jail ministries and is a volunteer in homeless shelters. Uh, he received his PhD from Fielding Graduate University and an MBA from UCLA. So, Randy, wonderful to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, and thank you, Hillary and uh, Katrina. I really enjoyed the words that you spoke. To um, just add a little bit more, uh, a little bit of a little more context. I wrote a textbook, and I'm going to put it to you this way, so you don't get distracted. It's not a book promotion, but. Uh, on, on the economics of disasters, and I've been working on disaster sites since 1986, so probably before some of you were born, but um, this one's, uh, th this is a new, this is a whole new deal. Um, you know, I've been to seven continents looking at disasters, but this is uh, new territory. And, um, but I, I wanted to kind of put it in context with other disaster scenes that I've seen, and I'm gonna use a very unusual word to describe kind of the theme of what I wanna talk about. And Hillary, if you wouldn't mind putting up my slide. Um, I put together a disaster index, and I, I thought long and hard about what disasters I wanna compare COVID-19 to. And I'm going to compare, compare it to the Bikini Atoll nuclear weapons test sites which was the largest environmental disaster in the history of the world, far, far larger than Chernobyl. Um, and I've been to both. And, and then also Hurricane Katrina, which um, I don't think the media ever really did justice with the scope and depth of that tragedy. Um, to just kind of compare side by side some of the characteristics. Now, the, the way this is weighted and, and uh, scored is there's no subjective thoughts. It's just you look at the categories and you're either in or mixed or out. And um, you can see the Bikini Atoll uh, column. In that case, my clients lost pretty much everything. And you'll see what I mean as we kind of go down the list. They lost food, water, and air. Uh, they couldn't even breathe the air without um, the air quality, the, the nuclear testing, the, the air was literally radioactive. Um, I had clients whose children died. So very, very serious situations, very sad situations. Their housing was gone. They lost all uh, infrastructure, all communication, um, no emergency services, no travel. They, were pro they, they weren't just quarantined. They were prohibited from going back to their uh, islands and to their homes. Uh, all their community services, churches, uh, stores all shut down. Um, the one thing is that there was no hoarding and there was no looting, uh, which says something about their culture um, that I think we could learn from. Uh, and all commerce were shut down. They would sell their coconuts and their, their crops from their islands, but because they were uh, tainted with the stigma of um, the nuclear weapons tests, nobody would buy their produce or um, anything. So, so that's... Uh, that's something now, this, this uh, index has been published far and wide, and I, I got some pretty severe criticism from, from one gentleman uh, who had lost a lot of money in the stock market. And I felt bad for him, and frankly, I've lost some, a lot of money in the stock market too. But I, I, I don't know that I would trade uh, places with these folks because they lost more than, you know, a, a part of their portfolio. They lost their homes. They lost everything. So... I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is that the COVID situation is serious, I get it, um, but the key word is gratitude. I think that if we look at some of these other situations that people have not only gone through, but have rebounded from, uh, we, can, we can get a little sense of gratitude that, hey, things are tough, and I'm not trying to downplay that, but uh, other people have recovered from, from uh, bigger setbacks. Uh, and we ought to maybe look at look at those case studies as um, as uh, some to give us some insights. The other disaster is Hurricane Katrina, and you can go down the the list there and see where where we hit. But there's a lot of red X's where people lost an awful lot. I 
I went there 20, 25 times. David knows that I worked on uh, this for my dissertation and um, interviewed people there and watched the recovery over the series of, of many years. And, and yet when I was first there, the water was still receding and people had mud in their homes, you know, three feet deep. So, um, and, uh, but COVID-19 is different because it's affected literally everybody on planet earth. And whereas up until now in my career, um, seven continents, 50 states looking at disasters, um, I haven't seen anything like it. I don't think anybody has. And so, I, for example, I was doing a TV interview when this first broke and I was in the studio in Hollywood. And normally during the commercial breaks, you know, they're talking about car crashes and this and that. And in the commercial breaks between the, in, in the newscast, the news anchors are kind of talking, to, you know, about whatever. Um, you know, there's a lot kind of a playful attitude. But during the news breaks, uh, when I was in the studio in, <laughs> in L.A., uh, people were frankly, even the newscasters that are usually very calm and collected, they were kind of freaking out uh, because they themselves were out of, you know, um, paper towels and napkins and toilet paper and everything else like everyone else like everyone else and they were living the disaster rather than just reporting it um but i think that um there's some practical things we can do with the minute i have left in terms of daily habits i, I wrote a book in fact i wrote i worked on the book uh, me we do be while i was at fielding and um basically what i did is i scientifically correlated various daily habits very practical habits with elevating our level of happiness and little things like making our beds in the morning, um, we improve our mood 206.8%. If we work out, exercise is, is uh, essential to get, you know, keep moving, 23.2% more happy. If we meditate or pray, 51.8% uh, uh, happier. If we're simply kind to people um, and smile more, 46% happier. Um, if we organ use our, our downtime to organize our space, we are 300% more likely to be happy as opposed to if we live in clutter. Um, so I think we need to really look at our situation, look at uh, our, our, the landscape of our days and kind of choose things that are going to increase this level of happiness and also keep this disaster in context what our, our fellow human beings have been through and have uh, risen above it successfully. I'm certain that we all will do the same. So I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, but thanks for letting me share a few thoughts. Thank, thank you so much, Randy. Um, uh, where do you think this is gonna go? I, I'm, I tend to be optimistic. And I think that we've kind of, uh, I think in a, another week or two, we're going to be talking a different story about, you know, more and more uh, ability to get out and return a little bit gradually to normal life. I know some people don't share that point of view, but I, I think that's where we're headed. That's great. And uh, I wonder if some of our panelists might have uh, questions for you too, Randy. I, you know, this you know some of the folks and some of the folks uh, don't know you maybe time for one question or two questions from uh, any of the other panelists um david i have a question that's um kind of a summary of some questions that are popping up from the chat uh, and randy that is you know one of the things that's a real hallmark of what you did is to demonstrate how context in, the importance of context in each of these cases at the same time what we might learn from one situation to the next. And I wonder if you all have some additional thoughts about that. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I, when I go into, I do a lot of, since fielding, it, it changed my whole heart. It changed my whole view, uh, worldview, frankly. And I, I go in, I, I work in San Quentin prison and the Orange County jail system as a volunteer. And I think when we just um, add that context, uh, I, I I look for things to be grateful for in this, even though I'm like everyone else, I'm quarantined, I'm not with my family, I haven't seen a family member in a month, but it, I, 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 am, and I don't appreciate that, but I do appreciate, for example, that when I go in and visit an incarcerated personnel, I have a little more empathy for seclusion. I, I realize now that that is really a painful thing that they're going through that I didn't appreciate, and I still don't appreciate. I, I don't pretend that I, I do, but I'm an I'm a inch closer to that. So 
I think that what we got to do is just think a little creatively of, okay, this, this kind of is lousy, a uh, lousy situation, but what can I do to kind of get something of value out of it? Thank, thanks so much, Randy. We do have a, a, another question that follows up on this and folks are asking for uh, the title of your book and your website and so on. So maybe later, if you could put that into the chat for folks. Uh, Penelope Bustamante has the question, how do you suggest we build resilience into our gratitude as this event goes on for the next few months? Yeah, it's an outstanding question. I tend to be very, I try to be very pragmatic about it, very practical. That's why I, you know, I, what I did in putting the book together, uh, the title is Me, We Do Be, is I, um, I surveyed 5,000 people in the United States, Canada, the UK, and Australia, and using a lot of skills, frankly, that I used from, that I learned from fielding, how to statistically correlate daily habits with measurable uh, levels of happiness, or uh, there's various measures of success, and, and, and uh, money is just one of several. Uh, when people hear the word success, it sends some people off um, in different directions. But um, so in other words, I was very interested in not just uh, for my own curiosity, but tools to teach the homeless and the incarcerated and people in battered shelters and that kind of thing, actual tools that, hey, if you will do this, you will get this result or you're more likely to get this result. Like making your bed um, correlates with, you know, becoming a millionaire. I got my kid, uh, my teenage kid to make his bed three days in a row with that statistic. So so I'm always looking for these practical ways of actual how behavior correlates with results. I'm, I'm just big on that. I love the anecdotal, you know, concepts too, but I like the practical, hey, if I do this, I'm going to get this result or have a better chance at it. Thank you so much, Randy. We're going to move on now to our next speaker. My goodness, we could go on with you for the whole day, we know, and every one of the other speakers as well. Michelle Tierney is Vice President of Organizational Development and Innovation for South Central Foundation's two-time Malcolm Baldridge award-winning NUCA System of Care. Absolutely fascinating what they are doing. Uh, Michelle has provided more than 25 years of quality improvement, organizational development, and strategic planning services in support of South Central Foundation's Alaska Native leadership and customer owners. So Michelle earned her PhD in human and organizational systems at Fielding in 2016. And her dissertation studied the impact of the relationship between primary care providers and customer owners on health outcomes. So Michelle, we're happy to have you with us. Hello everybody. Um, so that was uh, wonderful to hear Randy. I'm um, thinking, what am I gonna say next? So. I'm gonna go more um, to just uh, uh, what a healthcare system looks like and kind of what's been happening for us here in Alaska. So um, just a little bit more, um, we're a healthcare system in Alaska. David gave a great um, uh, description of it. Um, we have a full range of healthcare services. So everything from behavioral health to dental, primary care, complementary care, traditional healing, many, many community-based programs, residential treatment programs, we're also a um, 150 bed tertiary referral hospital for the entire state that serves about 120,000 Alaska Native people and veterans um, in those more remote uh, places. Many of the places that we provide services to are small villages that are really difficult to get to. So our challenges around when emergencies happen, when crises happen are multifactorial. While we may be a small state uh, in numbers, we're a big state in geography. So um, I think the thing that helped um, us a little bit is that we had a pretty big earthquake in uh, 2018 and a 7.1 earthquake where it shook the ground and kept shaking the ground and we kind of activated all of our emergency systems and had an amazing response from the community and the healthcare system to that emergency. And we, I think we walked out of that feeling pretty darn confident in ourselves how we can you know, we can get through anything because we, we managed to survive an earthquake with no deaths. Um, and then here comes 2020 and we're all minding our own business and um, the buzz starts to happen about this virus that's out there that everybody started talking about, maybe it's flu-like and maybe it's just another flu. And, and then around two, February 24th, it started to get more real for all of us. And that's when it, at South Central, we started to really think about 
what do we need to do? What do we need to start planning? What's this look like? Um, two, three, March 11th is when the pandemic was officially named by the World Health Organization. And by that point, South Central had really started thinking about um, our emergency preparedness plan isn't preparing us for what this is. As Randy said, this is a whole different beast. This is a whole different thing. What's it look like? When's it end? When, what's gonna happen next? Um, and on 325, we anticipated as a state that a lot of people would be returning from travel because that's our spring break week. So that's 325 is when our governor declared a hunker down. Um, but as an organization, about four days before, we had already started, we had already decided to start having most of our employees start moving to remote working. We started to shut down services, think about different ways of providing services by virtual and other means so that we could protect not only our customer owners, the patients who come, but also to really protect and address the fears of the workforce. We have about 2,700 people that work for us. So that's a pretty large, and if you count all their family and friends, um, we are a big part of the community in the state of Alaska and especially in Anchorage. So uh, some of our fears, besides the biggest fear for me, which is I'm never gonna get a haircut again and it's really freaking me out. Um, I've had to cut my husband's hair, which is not a good idea. And also, I hate the way I look on Zoom, and um, I've had to just get over that fear. So other than those really, really practical fears, there were some things that we had to think about as an organization. The first thing was, is are we really ready? Do we have enough for personal protective equipment? Everybody's heard about N95 masks. Nobody ever knew what they were before, but now everybody knows. Um, how do we get them in Alaska? How do we make sure we have enough of them? When will we use them? Who will get them? Who doesn't get them? Should everybody wear them? Um, so PPE became a big, a big fear or real, uh, and a concern. Um, the good news is, is we were smart and practical and we started ordering and we started using our innovation and people started making masks, whether they were using 3D printers to make face shields, people were making homemade masks, and then we were protecting that supply of N95s and then trying to keep that supply chain running. IT infrastructure was a big deal for us is, you know, if everybody starts doing virtual, everybody's on Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Skype or all of these things, how in the heck is our infrastructure gonna uphold, uh, support all of it? So we had to have a really intentional plan around how we were gonna roll it out. And the reality is, is it actually can, if we're smart about it. And we all know what it means and we all learn a little bit more about how to use it effectively and not just hit buttons until they work, but we actually know what the buttons do. Um, learning from others. A lot of people, I think, went into the state of, let's just go insular, let's just figure it out ourselves, and let's just keep reacting. And what we did instead was we reached out. We're like, there are a lot of people smart, and a lot of people doing really good stuff around this. So we reached out to Institute for Healthcare Improvement, which is a great organization, which, you know, people are struggling with. Where do you get respirators? Where do you, how do we learn from New York? How do we learn from China? How do we learn from Italy? And that's a really great organization that brought us all together so we could learn from each other and not make the same mistakes 50 times. Um, uh, let's think, get out of our own way. So all those policies, procedures, those things that we hold so dear and near to our hearts so we don't get arrested or thrown in jail, we just said to heck with them. We're gonna do the right thing, we're gonna do it quickly and we're gonna do it quick, um, and we're gonna do it so it makes sense. Um, real big things around job security. Uh, we really quickly knew that we had to pay attention to the workforce. And we made decisions early on and we communicated to staff that you have a job and you're going to get paid. And we did that quickly and timely because we knew what was happening and we knew what the fear was. Um, and those people who are working remotely who we couldn't figure out what they could do, we're figuring out what they can do to support because rather than sitting home and watching Netflix and watching TV and getting more scared, we're putting them to work, helping out in any way that they can. Um, the other really big concern for us is um, domestic violence. It's a huge concern in the community. And while lots of people love being with their family and hunkered down, lots of people don't wanna be with their family and hunkered down. So our primary care system moved, that relationship-based system is their, their main job, other than staffing respiratory clinic, staffing the hospital when they need it, is they are making calls and they're doing chats, they're doing virtual, with customer owners who are at risk. So they're keeping in constant contact to try to 
help support them for families that they know are not that safe. So some of the lessons we've learned is don't listen to the media. Sorry, you gotta listen to the sources. So you gotta go to CDC, you gotta go to the World Health Organization, and then you gotta use your local smart people to interpret it for your context. And that's what we did. We, we, every day that somebody would say, that's not the right numbers. And we'd say, it is the right numbers if you go to the source. It's not the right numbers if you're listening to certain media outlets. Um, communicate, communicate, communicate. We committed very early to be very transparent. So every case of COVID that we have, every death that we have is shared immediately with all the employees as to where it was, what the response was, how are we making it safe for you so that it's clear to them um, if they're at risk. We provided housing early on for our staff who are working so they don't go home to their families. We provide money for childcare support so that people could take care of their kids when all the schools closed. Um, other things is you've got to keep it fun. For gosh sakes, this is really serious, but every once in a while we have to have a giggle, we have to have a laugh. So we're encouraging staff to take videos of themselves. Make sure you don't use, you know, get into HIPAA issues. But take videos, post them. People are making up songs and we're sharing them across the organization so we can still laugh with each other. Um, I think our big fear right now and our big concern is um, what's gonna happen after this because um, self-care for us was immediate. We did a lot of grounding. We have our behavioral health people doing um, learning circles, we call them. So they're group visits and they're on Zoom and we do it four times a day and four times a day people can join those groups and they can just check in, they can share, but there's also grounding techniques and there's workout videos that we're putting up and just all these fun things that people can do to stay connected. But we really are worried about the impact of all this isolation on many, many people. Um, so I think I'll stop, I'll stop there. So thank you. Thanks so much, Michelle. I certainly learned a lot from what you had to say. There was a rather provocative question from Julie Smedzik O'Brien, a uh, question about the U.S. president's move today to stop U.S. funding for the World Health Organization. What does that mean for the world and for the U.S. from your perspective? Um, well, I, you know, maybe I shouldn't say this, but our, I think our president is somebody who's not a very intelligent human being. So. Um, I think what it means for the world is that other people will keep paying attention to it. What it means for healthcare is we'll keep paying attention to it. Um, and hopefully it can survive. I hope others uh, figure out a way to support the World Healthcare Organization. Um, retracting funding or US support for it, I think in no way diminishes it. It actually in some way right now in this political climate could actually increase its, its relevance in the world. So um, it's a shame. Um, but, and it's all a political game. And unfortunately, that's the unintended consequence of some of these things that are happening. Thank you so much for that answer. I was especially impressed that you took care of your employees right away. Uh, I don't know about Alaska. We, I'm sorry, we don't hear it so often. How, how are things going there? Is, are you having a situation like New York or California or it's not come yet? Where are you? No, we're doing, we're doing actually pretty well. Um, all, it seems like we've flattened our curve. So because we did a hunker down right before spring break and we've had other health mandates um, around restaurants closing and, and all of those similar things to other locations, the number of cases we have in Alaska is of 285. We've only had nine deaths. Um, we've had 98 people recover and currently we have 32 people in, a hosp in hospital. So. Um, so we're doing overall relatively well. I think the next 10 days will tell if we've really done what we should be doing. And we're already talking about how we stand back up sectors by sector to see if you open up one sector of business, you know, can you, do we see a bump up in numbers? So we're not going to just flip our switch back on, but we're going to, we're going to slowly get back to um, where we used to be. There's a question also about First Nations people. They have certain rituals regarding childbirth and death, which often takes place in hospital settings. How are the people in your community dealing with those? And there are also a number of other questions which are more general. I'll, I'll put them into the chat or you could see them in the Q&A. Yeah, so um, right now, so a lot of, the, a lot of our locations, um, 50, I think it's actually 65 remote locations that we provide services to um, are only, um, you can only get there by plane in. 
uh, all of those communities have actually shut down access to the outside world. So many of those locations don't have as many people coming in and have had fewer cases. Um, we have had some cases in Ketchikan, which is a smaller community, and also in Fairbanks, which is the second largest city, but most of them have been in Anchorage. So what happens with death in those rituals is they're, they're doing like Alaska Native people do, which is they're resilient and they have uh, specific rituals around waiting for springtime because our earth is frozen um, in the winter. So good news is COVID hit during the winter months. So people don't typically get buried during our winter months. So they have process and, and ways in which they preserve the bodies so that they can be then um, buried in the springtime. Thank, thank you so much, Michelle. And there are a number of other questions there, it's, uh, particularly one from Sandy Chen from China. Maybe you could answer this one, then we'll go on to Pam. How do you think the current social distancing will impact people's connections post COVID-19, positive, negative? I, I think it's actually going to be positive because there's quite a bit of connection now um, that's less about just healthcare. It's more about how you're doing. So a lot of our healthcare providers are in the business now just checking in for you, not to say, hey, you're due for a test or an exam, but just to say, how are you doing? So I think it's actually gonna do some reinforcing in those. Um, also our elders, uh, what we've done with elders is we've taught them how to use Zoom and iPads and those things. So a lot of their younger grandkids are actually getting more connected time with their grandparents. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's going to be, I, I, the, the one worry I have is around, you know, technology has created a lot of distance for a lot of people. So if we, when we, when we leave this and if we keep using these technologies and we don't come back together in some ways, um, people might, have, might prefer this way of interacting. And um, I, I, don't, I don't think that's the healthy way to do it forever, but I think it's a really good way to supplement relationship. Yeah, and with that, um, Michelle, just one of you might look at the questions because there's a related question from Jean Lee uh, Weeks Parker about the disabilities and, and learning possibilities with new technology. So you might take a look at that and, and address it. Uh, which one is it? I'm sorry. It's, it's, in, the Q, uh, it's, in, the it's in the Q and A. Under uh, oh, look. okay. So thanks so much, Fred and uh, Michelle. Thank you so much for all your perspectives. Our next speaker, Pam Rutledge, is a Field and Graduate University Media Psychology doctoral faculty and lives in Corona Del Mar, California, USA. Uh, Dr. Rutledge is a media psychologist uh, focused on bridging research with practice. She uses theories and research from psychology and neuroscience to solve real world problems by understanding audience narratives and behaviors in response to media content in a social context. She began her career as a media producer, creating marketing and recruitment materials for colleges and universities. She also has a consulting practice and has worked with Warner Brothers, the Oprah Winfrey Network, 20th Century Fox Film, Saatchi and Saatchi, and the US Department of Defense. And she's a frequent uh, commentator uh, in the New York Times, uh, ABC News, and the Wall Street Journal. So, Pam. Oh, thank you very much. It's really wonderful to be here. and it's. Um, really inspiring to be here with this august uh, panel. Um, I want to take a, a sort of a more practical perspective. One of the things that I do with the clients that I work with is try and help them make sense in a very practical way about these trends that they're seeing. And, and the best way to do that for me is to say, what's a, what's a heuristic they can use for decision making? So if we say, what is the psychology of this pandemic? Well, first of all, nobody really knows because it hasn't happened before. The research that we can pull from tells us what it's like to be in a quarantine. It tells us like what it's like to be in a crisis. It tells us like what it's like to do something of over a sustained period, but it doesn't put all of these things together. So we're sort of in a whole new normal. And you know, people have been saying, is it gonna get back to normal? It's never gonna be the same again. Is it gonna be good? Yes, I think it'll be fine. But I think people are gonna really start questioning some basic things because of the wet we're going through now and because that's in a sustained way. The one thing, and Randy, I thought your chart was really interesting. The one thing that I think is very interesting about COVID compared to the ones that you were looking at is that this is invisible. There was no, it wasn't like 9-11 where we saw the plane. It wasn't, there was no tsunami. There was no disaster that people could look at and point to and have some sense of narrative understanding. 
it's completely without a mental model. And so that's been why we've been seeing this popularity in the movie, for example, Contagion. Contagion, this movie that was made about eight years ago, is the second most downloaded film after Harry Potter. Thank you very much, go Harry. Um, so people, why are people watching a disaster film in the middle of a disaster? It's because we have this natural instinct to seek information. And I think Deborah's going to be talking about some of the technical stuff, and I'm going to be giving you a very sort of, um, call it uh, broad heuristic for thinking about how we are in a climate of fear, right? We are right now operating from our instinctive emotional level. Think of it as the lizard brain. So if you think about that, first of all, it ought to help you to have some compassion for yourself because you are not thinking with your rational brain for others because they are not behaving with their rational brain and certainly your children aren't, right? So if you're, you're, at, you're at home with a bunch of lizards, right? And they're all racing around, everybody's hyper reactive because they're all afraid. They're afraid because this is a mortal threat. It's a threat to our physical health, it's a threat to our well-being and it's a threat to our psychological health. So what are we supposed to do about this kind of thing? Um, I think if we can recognize that and have compassion, it's time to give each of us the giant hall pass. We don't have to be the perfect homeschooling parent. We don't have to be uh, you know, the perfect worker. Everyone that I've talked to, every client I've talked to in the last week, they're going, I'm not getting anything done. I'm not productive. I can't think. I'm making mistakes. And it's like, yeah, it's a pandemic. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to be human. What would be bad is to not acknowledge the level of anxiety and stress that we're under. I realize that it's different from other crises. And then there was, there's one sort of meme going around, you know, our you know, grandparents were t called to war to fight for our country and you're being called to sit on your couch and watch Netflix, so don't screw it up, right? That's a, a funny meme, but it diminishes the sense of trauma that people are going through with this level of lack of agency and social separation. So I think it's important to, to recover from trauma, to acknowledge what you're going through, acknowledge the anxiety and fear so that you can make meaning out of it and experience the post-traumatic growth, the resilience and the positive emotions. So to that end, if you start with acknowledging your anxiety, and this is especially important when you're dealing with children. I mean, we're, you know, I'm trying to learn how to homeschool third grade French and that's hard. Uh, well, you're trying to deal with all of these things. And, and if you can't acknowledge that you're anxious and afraid, that what you're communicating to your children is, is gonna carry that message you know, without intention. So if you can acknowledge your anxiety, it will put you in a much better position to be reassuring to them. Um, I think as Randy was saying, which is a really good point, establishing regular routines so that life takes on some semblance of normal. It isn't that it's normal, it's that you now have agency in a world where you feel out of control. And that sense of agency is calming to the brain and it sort of counteracts some of the fear because the, the greatest fear of our of survival is we can't control our environment. That's what makes us so afraid. So if you can establish routines, whether it's make the bed, have breakfast at the same time, put on lipstick, you know, whatever it is, then it allows you to feel like you have achieved some portion of your own identity and your own world back. The other thing is to seek balance. You know, a lot of people say, well, they don't watch the news, don't all do all this. And I think it's important to not worry so much about screen time. And, and in fact, I'm, I'm not too worried, Michelle, about people resorting just to, to di the digital world. In, in, from my perspective, people want social connection. They will choose the method that's most effective to achieve it. And so at the point when they can hang out with each other, they won't just stay home and Zoom because it isn't as meaningful it's way better than nothing. But those, lowering your standards, giving up on how many hours has my kid been playing Roblox or Minecraft? You know, how many episodes of The Office did I watch in succession? All of these things ought to be set to the side and you ought to be looking at them as saying, how is this making me feel? What's the content I'm consuming? Is it making me feel better? Is it making me feel worse? And make the judgment of on what's too much consumption based upon whether there's balance and your emotional state. Now, that being said, I do agree with the position that 
you shouldn't watch too much news. We have a natural tendency to seek information when we're uncertain. And unfortunately, this information has been very inconsistent and very conflicting across different sources. So it's the natural tendency is if you can't get a single answer is to keep looking, right? Because there must be the right answer out there. And I know, you know, all any of you who are still students know that you keep looking just because you're sure there's something really smart out there that you haven't read yet. And if only you could find it, then you could finish your dissertation. But it's like that when we're scared, we're looking for that last piece of information. So I would encourage you to use this model of judging your emotion when you're consuming news content. Because as we know from sociologist George Gerbner that people who watch too much of the news start to believe that the world is actually even more dangerous than it already is. And oh my God, we don't need it to be more dangerous than it already is right now. So think about that when you're balancing the news consumption. Uh, the, the other thing that I would say is in your family, if you're recognizing that, that there's all of these, this tension, don't deny it. Don't tell your kids it's all going to be fine. Tell your kids you're going to do everything possible to keep them safe because that's something you can mean that's true and that you will do to the best of your ability. But don't promise them things that are out of your control because kids aren't stupid, right? They know when you can't do something, but they also know when you're talking to them with true intention. And the, the final thing is once you've acknowledged the negative, then you're in a really good position to start thinking about what are the benefits that we can find in this situation. You know, one of the benefits that I've noticed and is a really minor thing, I'm much more careful about waste. I'm much more careful about using leftovers. I know that sounds, you know, inconsequential, but there's all kinds of small ramifications that move through a system where little decisions have big impact overall. If you're paying more attention to not using waste, then there's less consumption. You're paying more attention to connecting with your family. You establish new relationships. I mean, interestingly, my family's been having Zoom meetings. I'm now seeing my nieces and nephews who live all over the place much more than I was before because we only saw each other on holidays. But now because there's family Zooms, we're connecting. So recognize the, the positive, Exercise gratitude, find something every day to appreciate in this new environment, even if it's just that, you know, you really like, you know, eating tacos and give yourself a break that it doesn't have to be perfect right now. The whole point is to get through the best possible mental health that we can, because that's going to dictate the speed of our recovery. And I'm done. Thank you so much, Pam. Uh, like to the parts about routines, I find myself getting into more routines and also the connecting and balance and not looking at the news late at night on your iPhone. I, I was doing that for a while and I wasn't sleeping well. So then I realized, okay, after 10 or 11, just don't look at it. Uh, and uh, exercise and gratitude, I like that expression very much. We have a question uh, from an anonymous attendee. I'd like to hear more from any panelists. What positive lasting change do you think will result in the larger U.S. global community as a result of COVID-19? Well, I'll tell you what, I, I think there's going to be a reevaluation of values. I mean, we're seeing that I think companies are going to start being judged differently. You know, uh, Mark Cuban, uh, owner of the Mavericks, said the other day that brands are going to be judged for the next 10 years on how they behave right now towards their employees. In other words, we're starting to view this whole thing as a system. We're starting to recognize the humanity. We're starting to value the relationships because that's what's contributing to our mental health. So I think there'll be a shift in values away from the sort of conspicuous consumption to more human uh, oriented things. Wow. Uh, that would be wonderful. My thought immediately when this began was universal health care in the United States. Uh, but, uh, and I don't think it's too much to hope for. Uh, we do have an, a question too uh, about, um, you know, we're wondering when someone will provide us with a test so we know whether we can go out or not. I really That'd would. That'd be good. My, my grandchildren, uh, I'm guessing I may not see them for a year. Right. So, so I just am wondering about this. Uh, where do you think we will get some assurance along those lines? I, I'm, I'm probably not the right person to ask. The medical professionals are probably um, a better, but I do agree with your last statement about 
it may be a year that people will adapt slowly without certainty. Hmm. So some people will go out, some people will be more cautious. Movie theaters are always really talking about, should they tell, sell tickets with a seat in between? Should they sell, leave empty rows in between? How do we get people in a theater if it doesn't feel safe? How do we get people to a ball game if it doesn't feel safe? So there's gonna be all kinds of adjustments that will unfold over time. This will not be flip a switch and everybody races back out and behaves like before. Yeah, so Michelle, this is Fred. Uh, thanks very much for a very energizing talk. And I, I had a question myself. I was glad to see you mention George Gerbner in there. And uh, it made me think, especially because your area is media psych, you know, back to his cultural indicators project and his idea of the, the way we receive news and frames that we have for, for making sense of them through the, his evil world ideas. Um, how do we make choices and how do we recognize that we're all in this together about what, uh, what sources of information we use for action, for example? Well, you know, that's one place. I mean, obviously there are many sources of information now more than there have ever been before. And I think that's one place where the breadth of media and entertainment media actually is, has a benefit. Because if you think back to the movie Contagion, at the end of the movie, Matt Damon tells us it's all gonna be okay. Right? In other words, there's been a story arc, we've understood the conflict, we've survived the existential danger, and we've, we've arrived back home. So I think that there's always humanity in entertainment because otherwise we wouldn't watch it, right? Because it's about people. So I think that that's an opportunity in the media to actually enhance that human quality, to enhance the sense of connection to themes and narratives that will be ultimately positive. So I tell people, don't watch the news, watch Netflix. Well, we need Walter Cronkite to be. Yeah, uh, right. Well, we need, yeah, a newsman who <laughs> remembers the old days, right? Yeah. Dating myself. We had one other question and then, uh, uh, oh, Fred, you're, you're transitioning. Okay, good, please. Sorry. Well, I mean, I didn't do that, but that's okay to trans. Did you, you have another question, David? Or? Well, it's from Gigi Johnson, uh, maybe Pam quickly. Will this change how we look at older people in society and how older people look at their lives? Well, you won't see any older people until there's a test because we're all staying home. Um, but, you know, I don't know that it'll change how we look at older people. I think it certainly changes how anyone who feels at risk, whether they're older or you know, immunocompromised or something, how, changes how they view themselves in the world. And so I think in that sense, it's, it's very, um, there's some real cognitive dissonance between thinking of yourself as active and robust and feeling like you can't go out for fear of having bodily harm. What you would hope is that people then say, okay, I'm, I'm going to, I don't want to not live my life. What are the ways that I can live it fully and, you know, sort of balance that that anxiety. So I do think it's going to change how people view themselves and the choices that they make. You know, there's been a lot of evidence that we'll even see sort of depression era thinking, right? You know, where people spend less, you know, do more of, you know, DIY stuff. Um, Home Depot stock will go up, you know, stuff like that. Great. Thank you so much, Pam. Yeah, thanks so much, Pam. And um, it's my privilege to introduce our next speaker. Um, and we, we seem to have a real uh, West Coast tilt here. So another Californian, uh, Deborah Bendel Estrop, is coming to us from Redondo Beach. And Deborah brings a wealth, Deborah's on the uh, faculty of clinical psych uh, at Fielding and brings a wealth of research in various areas, all of which when you look at it as a whole, connect so deeply with what it is they were looking at research on mothers, research on depression, research on autonomy. And one particular piece that stands out for me is work that Deborah had done with HIV and the tension between um, autonomy rights and protection. And you might think about what are some of the tensions that play out now. Uh, Deborah, the floor is Thank yours, you. or the Golden Gate is yours, since you had that nice background there. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm coming to you today from a background as a health psychologist, a pediatric health psychologist. So professionally, I've been coping with stress 
on the ground through the neonatal intensive care unit, through pain problems. And I wanted to share with you some thoughts about ramping down on anxiety. And Hillary, if you could start, there we go. So it's been my experience that anxiety is a continuum. It, it certainly is not erasable at this point in our lives with, with this crisis on hand, with all of the isolation and the loss that, that people are facing, both professionally and personally. And for those in the audience who are treating others, there's not only coping with your own anxiety, but coping with the anxiety of people who are very compromised and had mental health issues before this began. So I wanted to present to you a short perspective on one of the documented research techniques that seems to help patients cope, people cope, with, with this situation. If we could go to the next slide, Hillary. So the amygdala, which Pam mentioned, really is fed by our media exposure and overexposure. The cortex evaluates a threat, sometimes correctly, sometimes not, and often fed by life circumstances. Let's go to the next slide. And, and so there are documented researched ways of rewiring the amygdala. Um, you probably know about the underlying techniques that support relaxation breathing, increasing your diaphragm. And actually today I saw an article that suggested that one of the treatments for those with, with co coronavirus is to move very frequently and expand their lungs as much as they can. What we do know is that diaphragmatic breathing calms parasympathetic responding. When you lie flat and breathe deeply all the way from your abdomen through your lungs, you quiet the vagus nerve, you very much in, encourage a lowering of parasympathetic responding. And parasympathetic responding is often documented or explained by feelings of heat, by feelings of shortness of breath, by fleeting thoughts, by um, a general anxiety within your body. So let's go on to the next slide. And, and so if, if you can utilize some of these strategies, it will turn on the relaxation system individually. And it may be that in working with many, many clients, you'll have to lead them through this step by step. And very often making a tape of, of your doing this is helpful. Um, the strategies that we know that are extremely helpful include deep breathing, which I've already mentioned, gratitude exercises, and for some people that's a practice before they go to sleep at night as, as they're relaxing in, into rest, that they remember and focus on the gratitude for two or even one thing that happened during the day that was positive, that was meaningful, and, and that made them feel calmer. Um, savoring each moment, if you can. Uh, spring is here, even if it's outside of, of our world, but even uh, those who can get out into the sun for a few minutes a day, that, that's helpful. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, other ways that really seem to help calm our amygdala are communicating constructively and supportively, respecting coping differences. So those who have fewer resources, those who are subject 
to myths and, and false information need to have respectful help given so that they can understand which media to pay attention to how and how it uh, impacts. The other thing I really want to mention to this group especially is I think that we have to give great credit to honoring the service you are doing. You are helping others. Fielding was in a very unique place in that we knew how to do online communication. We are learning more about doing online therapy and about working in small groups online, but the focus of helping others is really a noble calling. Um, staying updated using reliable sources, I can't just emphasize that too much. It's been my experience um, that getting false information and then that information being communicated in a kind of a, a, an ongoing cascade really is very dangerous for certain communities. Um, eating, drinking, and sleeping regularly are very important. Mini minimizing any substance abuse problems. Those who came into this crisis with addiction issues are especially suffering. And then for many fielding faculty, taking breaks is very, very important. Can I go on to the next slide, please? And I, I just want to mention a little bit about rewiring the cortex because the cortex as the uh, front of our minds can mistakenly activate the amygdala. So when the cortex identifies nature, danger, I'm sorry, it notifies the amygdala. So negative expectations, Anticipatory thoughts and worries are all part of, of what we try to work with with cognitive strategies. And then the last slide. So encouraging the cortex to stay in the right here and now, to try and rethink catastrophizing and tr to try and reframe negative automatic thoughts that are repetitive are very important as, as we work with ourselves and we work with others. That's it. Myself, thanks so much, Deborah. Um, and I think uh, there's a lot in terms of how we attend to our own bodies and our own health in there that also connects with how we think about others and, and health. Yes. Um, we, it's not really a question, but um, Sarah Kiriton, um had a comment, which I think we can turn into a question, right? And the comment was that she picked up uh, from what you were saying, the importance of compassion for self and others. And maybe you can say a little bit more about that. Yes, um, I, I think it's important not to get into an overload of compassion. The, you know, I read the New York Times and the LA Times intermittently, and I find that um, there's tragic story after tragic story, plus, of course, people you know that are ill, uh, losses that people have experienced without opportunities for, for the kind of closure and mourning that we're used to. So it's, it's a very um, narrow and important area to, f to try and focus on to remain compassionate, but not to become overloaded because that's what leads to burnout. We know that from the research. Okay, thanks. And we have actually a question from Jean Lee Weeks Parker who um, we know is very interested in air quality. <laughs> it's wonderful, and she makes major contributions to that. Her question is a very specific one, which is that her daughter calms down by walking around the neighborhood in the chilly nights. Um, Jean Lee doesn't leave, live in Florida, where I do. <laughs> do you advise making changes to cooler indoor temperatures to compensate for the transition from warmer to cooler temperatures for walking around? You know, that's a medical question and I'm just not qualified to answer it. I'm so sorry. 
and I don't have an answer either. So. <laughs> Uh, does anybody else on the panel know? Pro it, it really is a very medical question and probably very um, specific to the to the lung capacity of, of the walker. Yeah. Okay. We do have one uh, one more question from Penelope. I think Penelope is in Norfolk, if I remember, for an earlier question, and hers is about uh, connecting what you're saying to organizations and how the need for people to acknowledge that fear and anxiety are okay and our expected feelings. So it's, again, it's a statement about self, that it's okay to feel this, but also recognize that fear and anxiety for others is a normal reaction. Yes, I, I, yeah. Yeah. I often use the example with others of going into the grocery store a week ago and wearing a mask and gloves and suddenly feeling very overheated, my glasses fogged up, and, and I had, you know, what I thought was a pre-claustrophobic experience in this grocery store. Um, and I, I think understanding how the body reacts to threat and, and then learning to calm that is, is a very important experience for all of us now. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Deborah. And, um, Really appreciate your, your insights and a lot of things for, for all of us to learn from that. Thank you. Um, David, shall we move on to uh, another continent, right? Sure, absolutely. So, uh, we're so pleased to have Linda Zhang joining us. Uh, for Linda, it's tomorrow morning at nine o'clock in the morning, I believe. So Linda hopefully is having her second cup of tea already. Uh, <laughs> Linda has a strong connection with feeling. Linda has a strong background also as an executive coach with many, many multinational organizations and um, has also written a book recently about thinking about midlife. And her dissertation work at Fielding involved questions about um, <coughs> really the seeds of life and thinking about healthcare and the times of post and relationship to post traumatic growth. So, Linda. We're eager to hear your insights now. And thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Frederick. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm very happy to be sitting here in the early morning of 9 o'clock in Shanghai. And I'm honored to have a chance to share some of the voices I collected from people surrounding me. And also, I put different colors of those people, like seven fielding students and alumni in Asia cluster, and some of my doctor friends and coaching clients. So the first thing I would like to share with you is what's happened in the ground. You know, my keywords are restarting the new routines. Hilary, would you please help me to move to the next slide? Thank you. Yeah, in my life, the outbreak of virus actually brought me about 21 days anxiety. From the third week, I tried hard to reconcentrate a few hours per day in writing the last two chapters of my dissertation. And I found this is a good way to be focused in those days, I cried frequently, especially when there came a news of lost lives and sad family story from the lockdown city of Wuhan. I cried for Dr. Li Wenliang, who is also a whistleblower of the virus. He died on February 7th at the age of 35. By now, more than 870,000 messages were left on his last posting of his blog. People shared the sad feelings and the daily life stories with him, some even ask for his opinion before they make life decisions, as if he's still with us. His blog is becoming a wailing war for many Chinese people, including myself. When life is out of routine, emotion waves burn out energy, and social media brings overwhelming information that distracts our attention. It is useless to complain. We must face the reality, find the truth, and take actions, and restart the new routine. At this critical moment, people were pushed back to the very basics of their life. Protections are very important. And meanwhile, people also find, appreciate the simple pleasures in life, such as cooking at home, playing with kids, and picking up old hobbies and doing indoor body exercises. Like what Pamela just mentioned, I also watched nearly 10 different disaster movies at home, especially for those Korean movies. They were shooting very well, and I learned so much and feel a little bit calm in my mind, in my heart. And one of my doctor friends shared with me some of his feelings that he thinks 
the biggest impact for the if the medical system is far beyond the infected patients and their families, he even shared one sad story with me that one of his patients was paralyzed due to the delay of the second surgery. And the man was only in his uh, mid forties and the whole family feels so sad about this very bad thing and big loss. So what are the perceptions of COVID-19? Hillary, would you help me to move to the next slide? Thank you. So my keywords are reconnecting in a deeper way. My coaching work started virtually in mid-February and I got a chance to move out of my small circle and hear more about how others live their lives. I found more and more people had deeper emotional connection with each other and they become more empathetic and authentic. People speak out and confront different opinions with more courage. The virus is a disaster which brings tragedy and losses to many people. But meanwhile, it is also a trigger for us to make meanings of it and live the life differently. For example, I became more comfortable to accept, allow, and express the feelings of not knowing, not being willing, and sometimes simply not being fine. I also experienced the post-traumatic growth for another time. The first time was after my back surgery five years ago. That experience was a trigger for me to choose my dissertation topic. You know, people also started to reinforce their core beliefs through making meaning of COVID-19. My doctor friends witnesses many cases in the hospital that people suffer from not only the virus, but also other illnesses. They feel sad for those patients and their families. And now the suffering is doubled because limited medical resources were allocated to fight with the virus. They are more emotional than before, but meanwhile, they became more determined to save people's life with full efforts and heart. I admire those doctors, nurses, and volunteers as they are the real heroes who sacrifice their own health and life to save others. Okay, what have we learned? Actually, my key words are taking conscious actions timely. Hilary, would you please help me to move to the next slides? For me, I learned three things this time. Firstly, is to strengthen the inner immune system and protect our health. Second is to live a simple and authentic life with people who love and care. The third one is to release the inner anxiety firstly, and then to help others. Everyone has a story, need a secure base, and a waiting war. There is a very famous Wuhan writer whose name is Huang Huang. She wrote about 60 diaries during that, uh, during January to March. Uh, the name is Wuhan Diary. So reading her own stories and the stories she told in the diary, I released much anxiety. I got much energy and hope as I see gratitude, humanity, love and responsibilities that many citizens are demonstrating every day in Wuhan city. Now we can read many other diaries in different places in the world. Those are the love and healing energy sending from brave peoples. And I feel grateful for that. I also observe the clients I coach who are mainly business leaders from multinational companies. Most of them were facing burning challenges in both work and life. There's a sandwich type of high pressure both externally and internally. The external pressure is caused by market and demand shrinking, as well as the high expectation from headquarters in delivering business results. The internal pressure is mainly from motivating their teams to make breakthrough quick wins and meanwhile handling their own life challenges at home, such as kids and helping parents and also doing a lot of housekeeping things by themselves but their energy is easily exhausted every day. Both authentic leadership and adaptive leadership are so important for those leaders to bounce back and focus on the shared goals and be the role models to empower their teams. Exactly the U curve they have experienced is also following the parts of reflect, reconnect, and reinvigorate. I like this quoting, as I quote this from Terence of Hong Kong alumni who shared his three key things when I collect the information and the thoughts. Okay, lastly, Hillary, please help me to move to the next slide, last one. 
Lastly, I would like to share a small reflection on the connection between my dissertation study and COVID-19. As a fielding HOD student, in the past three years, I have been deeply immersed in the research area of post-traumatic growth for people facing life adversity. My research areas on health challenges, it is one of them. Through the study, I interviewed 26 participants, 24 of them are Chinese. They emerged a nine step process for people to go through the growth path and make meaning of it. Not only the illness, but also their work, life, and other life crises they ever faced. In February, I wrote an article of Step Out from Anxiety, describing my feelings and experiences during the first 21 days after I know the outbreak of the virus in China. At that time, I realized suddenly that experiencing COVID-19 has a very similar path as experienced other life crises. The big difference is that this is pandemic. This is a disaster worldwide for everyone in the world. And at that time, my research question of this dissertation was, how do male and female Chinese executives make meaning and experience possible growth after significant health challenges in midlife? And now I would like to raise a similar question to all of you who are in today's webinar. How do you and the people surrounding you make meaning and experience possible growth now when the COVID-19 is still in our daily life? And here I would like to share with you my nine steps of my reflection of this COVID-19. I hope you will find your own answer after think about it, after listen to today's sharing, and after reconnect with people surrounding you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks so much, Linda. There's some wonderful insights, and it's clear that your dissertation research um, positions you and all of us in listening to you to make such deep connections for ourselves, our communities, and for our planet in ways of thinking about growth and, and also creativity. Um, you know, I'm wondering, uh, one of the things that we hadn't really allowed for is questions from panelists to other panelists. We, we did allow for it, but I'm wondering if there are questions that some on the panel might have for, for Linda. Well, while we're waiting for the question, but Deborah, it looks like you may have a question. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Linda for her final oral review for her dissertation fantastic dissertation and her final oral review will be coming soon I think maybe uh, within the next month or so. Thank you David, thank you. Um, so I'm very comfortable with with a little bit of silence even though we're supposedly using airtime whatever that means. <laughs> uh, but I, so I have a question for you, Linda, just from myself and listening to you. One of the challenges uh, that we have um, in the United States where I think we could learn a lot from the research you're doing in China is we're such an individualistic country that many people, when told to wear a mask, will say, I'm okay, <laughs> thinking that the mask applies to themselves rather than seeing that the reason that people should be wearing masks is so they're not trying. So thinking about it in terms of more of a collective approach and how we're, we're all connected and not just thinking of protecting yourself. And I'm wondering if there are some insights from your research that you might have about balancing sort of individualism and collectivism in terms of thinking about uh, ways of being in the world right now. Well, Thank you, Frederick, for your asking. Actually, individualism and collectivism is one of my area in the research, but traditionally people would like to follow a lot of right direction or discipline a little bit. So when uh, big, you know, uh, disaster things happening, like in the very early stage, when people don't know how serious it is, we see the, the, you know, the death case happening in Wuhan and very quickly the country assigned about for 42, more than 42,000 doctors and nurses from other hospitals to Wuhan and Hubei province to save the lives of those people. Then we realize, oh, this is really serious. And the best way is to follow the direction and also to protect ourselves. That's the best citizen responsibility we can do. So from the first day, like me and my family members and many of my friends, we just wear masks. 
wash hands and keep social distance. Some of my friends don't even go out home for about three weeks, <laughs> you know. So this is really something that people just balance. What, what is the consequences if I don't do this? Or is that the right thing for me to do it? So there's no doubt here in my you know, community and society that wearing masks, washing hands, keeping social distance is such a very difficult things to follow because we see the consequences, we don't do it. Hmm. Well, thanks. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, and thank you for a very stimulating presentation. Um, I'm you. getting a signal that we, we're, yeah, we're, we're doing what we usually do, which is none of us, uh, well, I shouldn't speak for all of us. David and I always struggle with time management, right? <laughs> um, so we should move on to our next speaker. And thanks so much, Linda. And our next speaker, I'll give a short introduction because he has a lot to say. So I don't want to take up a lot of his time. But this is uh, our colleague, Four Arrows, who um, is a senior faculty member in education. Uh, part of the School of Leadership Studies coming to us tonight from Shamitla, Mexico, um, where he has really managed to hold on to all of the things that he values. Uh, a few things about him, if you don't know a lot of uh, Four Arrows' work, the, the idea of bringing indigenous perspectives and indigenous epistemologies to how we think of where we are ourselves and how we are in relation to others. Um, Four Hours also has this great book that I recommend to anyone, whether you've written a dissertation or not, called The Authentic Dissertation, because the majority of his work is really focused on making knowledge count, doing things in the world that allows what it is that we come to learn to make a difference, and also to rely very heavily on a participatory worldview. So, and I suppose he could, if we had more time, play honky tonk piano for us, but he's going to tell us a story. Thanks, Four Arrows, it's all yours. Sure, thank you, Fred, and it's good to be here with, with everybody. I, I guess with the three themes that we have, I'm supposed to talk about my experience, number one, about uh, fear, number two, and about lessons, number three. So let me get that over with. One, uh, I'm not surprised is my experience, um, and I feel lucky. Um, uh, two, um, I, I'm not, I don't have any, any, any fear, uh, but I, I see it everywhere. Um, and uh, three, uh, what lessons? I think that uh, business will be as usual if and when we get through this. Let me go back to those three, three things. Uh, I guess uh, not being surprised and feeling lucky comes from my time living on Pine Ridge where the average lifespan is 49 years old. Uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, suicide rates and tuberculosis are parallel to the worst of the third world countries. In fact, I got a letter from a, a, a friend uh, uh, today. Uh, he sent me a very concise text. He's not a scholar. He, he just wrote, I'm giving up uh, drinking for a month. And I just felt so bad because there's so much alcoholism on the res. And I, and I, I called him back and I said, what you, you, you've been the sun dancer, you're healthy, what's going on? He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you said you're, 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 you're giving up and that you're going to start drinking for a month. He said, ah, you know my punctuation. I said, I'm giving up uh, drinking for a month. Good. I see a couple of people nodding. That's a little bit of indigenous humor because the flip side of tragedy for us is, is humor. And, uh, and so, because what I'm going to say isn't so funny, and I wanted to start with some kind of a joke, and most of my jokes are long. So that was the shortest one that I, <laughs> that I know. Um, I didn't really get that, that letter, and it wasn't a punctuation problem. Um, my question is that, that it's not funny, is why are we focusing on COVID-19 like we are, and not on other preventable killers? I mean, three million, uh, Children under five a year, 300, uh, um, 3 million die of malnutrition every year. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, I'm not doing this well. You know, 100,000 people die of, of flu. Why are we worried about COVID-19? I'm not doing that. We can't compare these things. And this is completely different. And that reasoning is out the wall. But I am going to make a point. Right now, there's about 130 souls that have been lost because of COVID in, in, a, in the last three months. 
130,000. I would double that. I'd say there's 350,000. And everyone's talking about how we can cope, how we can be more compassionate, how we can... I don't think it's going to last unless we change a worldview that allowed us not to have this concern for the 3 million children that are dying of malnutrition every year. For the 9 million people, this is in Lancet, 9 million people are di dying every year from air and water pollution. 350,000, about what I figure COVID has is, 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 is done so far, from poultry and meat factories. Heck, I got an ocean out at my backyard and I'm not surfing tomorrow because there's a harmful algae bloom coming in. And the harmful algae blooms right now and that com combined with the plastic problem on the oceans is killing about 60 to 80,000. That's gonna start growing. What is it that is allowing us to focus on this with such passion all over the world and yet not these other things? It's a, we're, we're fear-based and we're selfish because this is affecting everybody. We don't know about those 3 million children that are dying. We, 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 those of us who are able to do this kind of conversation, we don't know about them. Well, we know about them, but you know, it's not close to home. It's not gonna happen to my Aunt Harriet, you know? And you know, we have to change a worldview. I thought we were gonna change with Donald Trump. You know, I predicted he'd get elected. And then I said, but you know what? When he got elected, he's gonna wake people up. They're gonna see what we've been facing, my people, for 500 years. They're gonna see why this is gonna make the world more dangerous. But you know what? A lot of good protests, a lot of good conversation. You know, the, the, uh, the so-called liberal media, unlike Fox News, has given you know, a, lot of, a lot of arguments against him talking about his lies but we couldn't even impeach him. Why? Why is it? Well, uh, I think that um, it's a worldview problem. And as long as we continue down the same path that the worldview that has gotten into this trouble is gonna be what we come back to, it's, we're gonna resume it. And after 9-11, we saw a lot of compassion, a lot of camaraderie, a lot of heroism. And now, you know, most of the, those, those people are, are suffering and not being taken care of. We've got, we had a, a student just uh, earlier today on a call talking about how now all these people at the halfway house that, are, uh, that have not been help, um, helped in any way, that are living in the streets, that are, you know, three-time losers, San Quentin, that are, you know, on drugs, they're all getting jobs now from people that don't want the jobs because their jobs are very dangerous with COVID. You know what he said? I, I could probably say his name and he wouldn't mind, but I won't. He said, um, you know, it's like throwing innocent people on a fire to put the fire out. And when the fire is out, they'll be forgotten. And so, you know, I've, I, um, I, I, I sent out a, a, a chart of comparisons between the worldview that we operate under now, generally speaking, most of us, and the worldview that we operated on for 99% of human history. Now, I'm just gonna name a few of them and then, I'll, then my time is up. Just to give a sense, uh, the dominant worldview a disbelief in spiritual energies, uh, indigenous worldview, recognition of them. The dominant worldview, disregarding holistic interconnectedness. And Fred, thank you. you. You asked that question about interconnectedness. The indigenous worldview, honoring holistic interconnectedness with the most incredible sacredness that we used to not even be able to say, Matakoyasan, which everyone says now we're all related because it was so vast and deep. Dominant, minimal contact with others. Indigenous, high interpersonal engagement and touching. Dominant, emphasis on theory and rhetoric versus action. Indigenous, inseparability of knowledge and action. Dominant, blindness to hegemony. Indigenous, hegemonic awareness and resistance to it constantly. 
Seeing time is linear on the left side, time is cyclical on the right, dualistic thinking on the left, complementary duality, mainstream acceptance of, of, of these injustices I've talked about, a collective and organized resistance to injustice everywhere. They're on, that's why they're on the front lines. Uh, trance is dangerous or stemming from evil. Trance-based learning is why we're in the mess we are in. Is we're not, we don't do it, we don't understand when it's done to us. Human nature is corrupt. Nah, human nature is malleable. Humor is entertainment. Humor is, I could go on and on with these things if we could just begin, because they all resonate when you hear those things, don't they? And you, yeah, but wow, I guess, I guess I do live with more or less rigid boundaries. And I guess I am allowing words to be deceptive. I guess I am being anthropocentric and not really thinking about the animals and on and on and on. If we read these right away, it touches our DNA but they're not in our education. This is a, I'm even, even talking at fielding. They're not, it's not there. It's not, in, it's not inherent in all of the curriculum. It's not in our media and it's not in our great movies. And I love Netflix for the most part. We see it here and there. We've got to look at the water that we're swimming in and my time's up. Thanks so much for our, it's, it's such an inspiring way to round out the, the evening. Um, we do have time for a few questions. Um, one from Bev Paulin, uh, which might have been asked of Linda Zhang, but since we're talking about interconnectedness, the question could be for you also, uh, which has to do with, uh, Given this challenge, does this change how we view the relationship of ourselves to organizations and organizational life? And the question was really for everyone. But four hours, I'll ask of you. Well, sure. Organizational life is the life of a holistic person. We all are in relationship. And organizational life doesn't stop with the building or the product or the focus. It extends. And it's, it's this, this idea of autonomy that we have. Indigenous cultures, those that are still holding on to the ways they are, you can't believe how autonomous they are. Uh, hierarchy does, d didn't exist. The idea of chiefs was, is, is foreign, except in reverse dominance, like in the Pacific Islands. Um, and with this organizational structure of managerialism and top-down leadership, that's hierarchy. And hierarchy starts with our superiority to nature and to animals. So our vision of organizations, if it can change from that hierarchy, and there's models out there, you know, this leadership leader is not a model, but it, they're rare, they're rare, right? And so all of these things that we're talking about in worldview apply to organizations. Thanks so much for ours. Um, David, I guess we should turn it back over to you. I do have one as a transition. It, it's a question for you for hours based on what you said, but you don't necessarily have to answer it, which is that in, you know, extending what you're saying to how we frame what it is that we're doing. We see that one of the big dilemmas in the US now is, is this a health problem? Is this an economics problem? And we see these as separate worlds and we are having to make a choice. Uh, okay. Whereas yeah. in an indigenous worldview, as I understand your expression of it, which I love very much, how we put ourselves in a position so those are opposing questions is really a, a question of worldview. Yeah. You got it. It's, it's a relational phenomenon that really believes in this interconnectedness and in non-duality, uh, complementarity. And, and, and I think it's understanding how the trance-based learning that we all, it's a natural way for us all to learn, uh, animals included. I learned it from wild horses. That this trance-based learning, until we learn metacognitive strategies for getting in touch with, wow, what is the source of my disconcern or my fear or my action? Once we start doing that and look at the options that we have with, these, with, the, with the two dominant operating worldviews, we begin to see that the fear that is driving most of us for competition, for money, for individualism, for ego, you name it, 
We just need to redefine it like indigenous people do and see that fighting isn't our stand, you know, or st even standing up to what is wrong is not the ultimate expression of courage. The ultimate expression of courage is generosity. And once we get that, everything falls into place. Thanks so much, David. I'll turn it back wow. to Mr. Rose and, and all the panelists. David, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, thank you. So I'm the co-host, so <laughs> go ahead. Thanks so much, thank Fred. And uh, oh, thanks for Eros. And oh my goodness, uh, we all learned so much. I want to thank all the presenters on uh, behalf of the Office of Alumni Relations. And also, we appreciate our grads. Thank you all for uh, being here. And uh, we do have another webinar on Thursday, a, a different slate of folks. I appreciated that quite a few folks who are presenting on Thursday came today. So thank you all for that so much. Uh, I'd like to end with just a couple comments here. Uh, Pope Francis said on Easter, this is not a time for indifference because the whole world is suffering and needs to be united in facing the pandemic. Indifference, self-centeredness, division, and forgetfulness are not words we want to hear at this time. We want to ban these words forever. We are all in this together. So indeed, respect, dignity, and love for all, especially at this time for public health workers and researchers, doctors, nurses, and medical workers, emergency services workers, custodial and sanitation workers, farm workers and farmers, grocery workers and public transportation workers. Our prayers go out to all affected by the coronavirus. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs>